palaces for the people. How social infrastructure can help fight inequality, polarization and the decline of civic life. With Professor Eric Kleinenberg of New York University. A public talk given on 27th of July 2022 and recorded on Microsoft Teams. So it is very nice to be here in an actual physical place and um, uh, I very much I, I very much hope that this is the beginning of a kind of a new moment where we're seeing each other more often physically uh, in in real places and interacting um, in a way that we used to take for granted. Um, that as it turns out is um, not just a kind of abstract aspiration. It's very much the theme of the conversation that I came here to have with you. And um, I want to talk about this um, idea, social infrastructure, and I want to do it by um, uh, kind of bringing you into my approach to the study of cities from the kind of vantage of a, of a social scientist. And I'm a, a, a kind of very much involved in conversations with designers and with policymakers, uh, with people who work in neighborhoods. But you know, I come to it uh, through research as a social scientist, um, and I hope my goal is to talk for about 45 minutes and give you a sense of where I'm coming from, and then we can open it up for conversation. I guess some of us are going to be walking around our, uh, Belfast with each other in the afternoon, so that should be nice. So. Um, uh, how do I want to start with you today? Um, I, 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 maybe the best uh, you know, way for me to, uh, to, to get going is to tell you about uh, how I got interested in this idea of social infrastructure in the first place. And uh, it started when I was a graduate student. Uh, I was a graduate student uh, in California at Berkeley, but I grew up in Chicago. And in the middle of the 1990s, I was living in France and uh, I read in a newspaper that Chicago, my, my, my native city, uh, was in the middle of a terrible heat wave. Um, do you have that concept heat wave in Ireland? I'm not sure. Do you need me to translate what that means here? Is it, I, Neil was complaining when he welcomed me about how hot it was and I was shivering you know, with gloves and a hat on. And, you know, so so um, I can't quite do the, the temperature translation, but um, uh, in Fahrenheit, it was about 106 degrees in Chicago for a couple of days. So it's like increasing like a typical summer in France now, right? So, so and, and timely, I'm sure, it, I know it did actually get a little bit hot here in Ireland last week. And of course, it was terrifyingly hot in Southern Europe. Um, we're still kind of coming to terms with how many people died and we're seeing these fires and we're seeing extraordinary bursts of heat around the world. And this, um, this, this time it happened in Chicago, uh, you know, came as a surprise. In the middle of the 1990s, there was not a discourse about global warming uh, in the way that we have it today. There were some scientists who talked about it, but they didn't get much attention. Um, it just seemed kind of extraordinarily hot and, and, and strange. And I, I was living in Paris uh, in a sixth floor uh, walk-up uh, apartment, and uh, it was broiling uh, there as well. But when I read about Chicago, the story was that uh, it wasn't just hot, it was also deadly. And I was reading about hundreds of people who who died of this um, this terrible heat, and, and I, I got very curious about how that happened and why. And I decided I was going to go back home and, and talk to people about what had, what had happened. And the first thing that happened was something very curious, that is, uh, a bunch of people I talked to who were very in tune with uh, Chicago politics, highly educated, you know, civic-minded, they they remembered that hundreds of people had died. In the end, it wound up being more than 700 people died from a heat wave that lasted just a couple of days. Um, but they had this idea that they said they weren't sure that the disaster was really real. That was the phrase that recurred at the time. But they weren't sure the disaster was really real. I thought that was a fascinating idea, right? That people could actually look at these refrigerated trucks that had come to the morgue in the center of the city, that those those trucks would be on television, uh, in newspapers every day because it was so spectacular to have so many hundreds of people dying in such a short period of time. And it somehow registered with people visually, but also 
it's, it was so detached from the reality for, for most people that they questioned whether it was really real. It was like a, they couldn't somehow couldn't take seriously, couldn't acknowledge and understand that other experience. It was so removed from their reality in Chicago. And Chicago, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, is a famously segregated city. I know we'll be talking later today about interfaces and peace walls and the way that it feels to live in a segregated city. And I was saying earlier, Chicago doesn't have peace walls, but you know where the peace walls are when you're in Chicago. You, 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 you know that you, you cross that street and you enter into a different social sphere. And when you live in a divided city, it can be more difficult to take seriously the lived experience of people around you. Even people who are separated from you by just a few hundred meters or a block or two. It, it's, it's possible for those worlds to be extraordinarily different and for the reality of life in one world not to penetrate into another. So that was the first stunning thing that, that I learned. Then I, you know, being a kind of aspiring sociologist, I wanted to try to understand, uh-oh, did I do something? Uh, I don't think so. No, okay. It's, it's, I'm fine, it doesn't bother me at all. It's just, it's just this one here. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, I guess life in, on Zoom is much easier when you're standing in front of your camera. You don't have to worry about any of these extra things like you know, microphones and light. Um, so, um, so you know, being a urban sociologist, what I wanted to do is really understand the nature of this heat wave. You know, who who did it affect? Where which people and places were most affected? And I decided to do what urban sociologists always do in these situations: I drew a map. And um, when you first draw a map of who lives and who dies in a heat wave in Chicago, it looks about like the most uninteresting map in the history of social science. It's it, who, who died in the heat wave in Chicago, people who lived on the south side and the west side of Chicago, which are the famously uh, you know, black segregated neighborhoods. They are, they are poor, uh, they, have concent they have concentrated poverty, they tend to have concentrated violence, high levels of vulnerability to all kinds of uh, diseases, there are places in Chicago that have had um, high vulnerability during the COVID outbreak. Um, there are places that have high vulnerability all the time. And so they, so it was the same during the heat wave, right? That is just about the least interesting finding in the history of sociology, right? That's, you would win no prizes uh, for a discovery like that. There's an open question as to why we don't do a better job protecting the people in places that we know are going to be hardest hit. Right, regardless of what the situation is, we oftentimes know scientifically which people are most likely to be affected by some problem and we don't commit the resources to protecting them that we could do. And that's a that's kind of a political problem, political crisis. But from the vantage of a social scientist, it's not especially interesting to note that the pattern of vulnerability in a crisis is the same as it is every day. It's, what you, it's kicking down an open door. Um, but then I looked a little bit more closely at the map and I learned something that was kind of surprising and that no one had really seen before. And this is really where my work took off and, and uh, became interesting. I, when I looked more closely at this map of heat deaths in Chicago, I saw that um, there were a set of neighborhoods that looked more or less identical demographically. They had similar levels of uh, the black population, poverty, older people living alone. They were the kinds of places, if you saw them on paper, you would think they would do just about the same in the heat wave. In fact, in many cases, these were neighborhoods that were literally next to each other, separated by one street. But when you looked at what happened in the heat wave, there was something remarkable, and that is that a cluster of neighborhoods that were in the zone in Chicago that suffered the most in this crisis. There were clusters of neighborhoods that actually did much better than even the most affluent, protected neighborhoods in the city on the north side. The places that are kind of famously wealthy, uh, the places that, that do well all the time. There are these clusters of neighborhoods in the segregated part of Chicago that demographically looked like the places that did really poorly did really well. 
the language we use today in the climate world is they, they look resilient if that word gets around here, right? And and that was really strange. You know, why is it that people on this side of the room would do very poorly and people on this side of the room would do really well, even though you, you're all kind of from the same group? And I decided what I wanted to do is start spending time in these different neighborhoods to see if I could make sense of the pattern. And, you know, it turns out there's a world of people who like to study things quantitatively. They, they use numbers and the numbers can tell us a lot of really important information and they can be very powerful for solving certain kinds of puzzles. And there's a world of people who like to spend time observing things and describing what things look like and watching people interact. And that technique and research is useful for an, another set of observations. And in this case, bringing the two things together was very powerful because as soon as I started walking around the neighborhoods, it was clear that there were there were some extraordinary and key differences that mattered. And what I noticed, first of all, is it, I'm going to just pretend for the sake of this conversation that people on this side of the room are living in a neighborhood that I'm going to call um, Englewood. <laughs> and people on this side of the room here are living in a neighborhood I'm going to call Auburn Gresham. And these are two neighborhoods in Chicago that are separated by streets, just as you're separated by these stairs here. Is that OK? So so we, I go over to Englewood and I start looking around. And what I find in Englewood is a neighborhood that used to have 100,000 people in it. And then jobs started to disappear from Chicago. Uh, big industrial employers left the city and went to places where they could get cheaper labor. Um, people left, the commercial institutions that anchored this neighborhood left. There were no more banks, grocery stores. Things started to fall apart. There were a lot of um, uh, abandoned buildings and empty lots. Do you see all the empty seats over on the side of the room here? This, it, as you walked around, look, if you're physically on this side of the of the street, you, you, you feel the sense of depletion. And with this depletion came a loss of political power. And so when the sidewalks would start to crumble, when the parks would start to fall apart, um, they didn't really have the political capital that you need to get things done. And in some ways, the, the kind of physical life of, the, of this neighborhood began to decay. And what that means there is if you live in Englewood in Chicago in the 1990s, you, you might feel comfortable on your block, but you probably don't spend a lot of time walking around from block to block outdoors. There's not really a wonderful place for you to sit, a, kind of a, a park or a community center um, you don't sit on the stoops on the on the stairway in front of your home. Um, there's not a, a routine where, you know, you see Neil at four o'clock every afternoon because Neil's always sitting outside of this coffee shop and you wave hello. And what that means is there's a kind of interpersonal estrangement within people who sit on this side of the room in this neighborhood. And so when it gets terribly hot in Chicago, and uh, Neil doesn't show up, he doesn't go sit outside. You don't really notice because Neil doesn't always sit outside. So it doesn't really occur to you, there could be something wrong with Neil, I should knock on his door and see if he's okay. There's a thing about a heat wave, which is that it's, every heat death is a preventable death because it's the simplest kind of human intervention that keeps someone alive in a heat wave. Or you, you knock on the door, you see someone is suffering, you get them into water or find a place where they can be cooled down somehow, and you can keep that person alive. No one knocks on Neil's door because if you live in, in Englewood, if you sit on this side of the room, you're just accustomed to a, 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 a kind of a thinner social life. And, and my argument about this is that that's not because of the values of people who decided to sit on this side of the room. They're just like you on this side of the room over here. It's that there's something about being in this neighborhood. There's something about the social infrastructure of this neighborhood that makes it less likely that people will, will interact, that makes the risk of isolation that much more great. Now, come over to this side of the room. I'm, I'm sorry you all made the choice to sit on that side of the room. It's a rougher day for you. But look, look, do you see all the people over on this side of the room? It's packed full over here. It's real. <laughs> the sun shines on this side of the room. Let's just look, 
someone who wants the light to work this way, let's not worry about it, we're gonna roll. <laughs> um, so uh, for those of you watching on Zoom, the lights keep coming on and off here. Maybe maybe it's about my hand gestures or something like that. I There's think a, a light sensor. Doesn't like that. New Yorkers like to talk with our hands. I hope that's okay with you. So, um, so on this side of the room, same poverty level, same level of racial segregation, same age composition, like everything is the same over here. As you can tell, people on this side of the room, they're just like you. But the, the, this neighborhood is kind of full of people. It doesn't go through that same process of abandonment and decay that happened on this other side. Um, the sidewalks are intact. There's a the grocery stores. There's a um, the community organization uh, that, that keeps busy there. There's little um, pocket parks, playgrounds, right? And uh, as a result, to live in Auburn Gresham, to be on this side of the room, is to be in kind of regular interaction with people around you. Now, it's not necessarily the warmest, closest interaction. It doesn't mean you're having drinks with each other every day. You're not hanging out. Uh, uh, you know, at the playground with each other all the time. But to live in a neighborhood that's thick with social life is to become aware of each other and each other's patterns so that when you don't show up at four o'clock in the afternoon on the bench that you sit on every four o'clock in the afternoon, you notice that she's not there because she's always there at four. She's always there at four o'clock. And, and it's 106 degrees outside call it 43 or 44, and, and you're concerned. So you knock on the door. Now scale that up. And Auburn Gresham, and Englewood, the death rate in Englewood during the heat wave is 10 times higher than it is in Auburn Gresham. 10 times higher across the street. And, and kind of more intriguingly, if you look at life expectancy, if you look at life expectancy, it's five years less in Englewood than it is in Auburn Gresham. You get five more years of, of life from living in a place with the kind of social infrastructure you have in, in Auburn Gresham. Now, when, when I first wrote this book, uh, Heat Wave, which came out in the early 2000s, I didn't really have the idea of social infrastructure built up. Um, it evolved over time, and I wrote about it more extensively in this book that you um, uh, described called Palaces for the People. And when I wrote it, um, we didn't really have this concept of social infrastructure in the U.S. And I know that in Europe, it is more of a concept, but I mean it a little differently than you do. And so if you don't mind, I'm just going to kind of try to give you a more refined idea of um, how, well, how I define social infrastructure. And you can keep that in mind as you kind of compare it to the way that it's used here. So when I say social infrastructure, I don't mean the education sector, the healthcare sector, um, the, care, the caring industries generally, uh, all the things that seem social in life. I have something more narrow in mind. So when I say social infrastructure, I'm referring to the physical places and, and I guess organizations that have a physical plant, but the, the physical places that shape our interactions. That's the kind of most simple definition I can use for it. The physical places that shape our interactions and I see social infrastructure not as a metaphor, but as a, a real set of places. Like social infrastructure for me is just as real as the infrastructure for water or for transit or for communications. It's think of it as the material substratum on which this higher order thing, social life, is built. And the argument that I make in this book is that when we invest in social infrastructure, when we design it well, when we, when we maintain it, and maintenance turns out to be a really big deal, uh, when we program it, and, and what, of course, you know, when we build it well, we get all kinds of returns to our collective life. It's also the argument in the book that when we don't invest in social infrastructure, if that category doesn't exist, if we don't have it in our toolbox, if it's not part of our policy conversation, things can easily fall apart. Right? We, we, we can try to do things to uh, 
build better quality cities or neighborhoods. We can try to improve uh, all kinds of social conditions. We can try to solve social problems. And if we don't have the concept of social infrastructure at our disposal, we're losing an incredible tool that we might have in our box. And of course, kind of the empirical case I make in, in, in my research is that in the United States and in many other societies as well, especially since the late 1970s and 80s, we have, we have kind of turned away from investments in social infrastructure and let the market do its magic. And the magic of the market turns out to be somewhat more beneficial for some people than others. And you see that when you come to Chicago because the, it is a jewel of a city if you pick the right neighborhood. So if you come to tourist Chicago and you see all the places that have been turned on by the market in the last several decades, there are extraordinary restaurants and coffee shops. The, the, the public spaces look beautiful. Maybe some of you have been to Chicago. I'm told it's the second largest Irish city in the world after Dublin. Um, but if you leave that kind of tourist, you know, urban glamour zone, things fall apart pretty quickly. And that becomes a, a you know, important question for, for social policy. Uh, let, let me illustrate this for you a, a little bit more, this social infrastructure idea. Um, one of the kinds of social infrastructure I talk about uh, in the book is, is the playground. And you, I know you have playgrounds here. I saw a couple of them you know, the other day. And I like to think of playgrounds as a form of social infrastructure that really matter. Um, I've read the Old Testament a few times, and I might have missed this. Maybe, maybe it's in the editions you have here. But as far as I know, there's no moment in that beginning section of Genesis where they say on fourth day, God created the playground. I don't recall that passage. It's not, we didn't get it from God. We came up with the idea that there should be playgrounds and that we should put them into neighborhoods and good things would happen if we did. And so if I asked you, you know, think about the last 50 years in Belfast, you know, how many, how many relationships exist in Belfast? Let's try this experiment. How, how many relationships do you think exist in Belfast? Because two sets of families, children and their parents or grandparents, uh, went to the same swing set in the same playground, often enough that at some point they started talking to each other and established some kind of camaraderie. They took a break. One parent got a phone call, had to go somewhere. They asked if the other could watch their child. Next thing they knew, they were having a picnic together. Then that turned into a play date. Then the families met each other. Does that, does that ever happen in Belfast, that thing I described? I can't tell. I'm still adjusting to social. It doesn't happen very often. What, what's, your, what's your guess at how many relationships exist in Belfast in the last 50 years because two sets of kids and their caretakers met each other on a playground. 12? Exaggerated. 15? Recently. Say it again. We're meeting each other more often in playgrounds. Well, this would be a great conversation because when I ask that question in American cities, people just laugh because it's, it's a, Maybe the dumbest question that's ever been asked in, in Belfast. It's such a dumb question. You can't answer that question, but people laugh because it's it's millions, basically. It's this, so it's it's such a common occurrence in American cities that it's it's a ridiculous question because it's the, it's kind of a, the the playground is an elementary space for the development of social ties. You can't even imagine social life without a, a, a collective space like that. Um, and, and, and yet, when I grew up in Chicago, uh, in some ways I was a beneficiary of uh, a, a set of investments that had been made in decades before I was born because the city had built out some parks and playgrounds, institutions like this. But in some ways I wasn't because Chicago had failed to maintain them. When, when I grew up, the playgrounds had glass on the surface. 
the equipment in the playgrounds was falling apart. Um, it, play, playgrounds were often places to be avoided rather than places to congregate. And the consequence is that we didn't have this resource for building connections that people in so many other places took for granted or that people fled Chicago and moved to the suburbs outside of the city to get. Right, such that there was a division between what you what you got if you left the center city of American of, of kind of Amer American metropolitan areas in the 1970s, 80s and 90s and what you got if you were in the suburbs. In the in the book, the kind of prime example of a, a social infrastructure that matters for uh, democracy that I give is the library and the um, virtue of the library uh, is or the, the, the public library is that it's open, that it's accessible, uh, that you don't need to be a citizen of the, of the, of the place to, to, to use it and to spend time there. Yesterday, Neil and I were walking uh, in the center of Belfast, uh, and what, what was the name of the little library? Uh, Which one? The Linen Hall. The Linen Hall Library. We, do you know the Linen Hall Library? So, we walked by and I said, Neil, I'd love to go check it out. And we walked in and I used my very thick and heavy American accent and asked if I could go in. And the woman at the desk said, of course, you're welcome to come into the library. And when I went into the library, nobody came up to me and asked me just to spend my money on anything I wanted there. I mean, I had the option to spend money in the coffee shop, but I didn't have to spend money to be there. I didn't have to spend money to look at the books. Um, there was comfortable furniture. I could sit there for a very long time. There were other people. They weren't all like me. Um, this is another thing that you don't find in Genesis, right? That, that it's not it, it, it's not our birthright to get a library. And um, years ago, uh, it, uh, in in the United States, in the run up to the election in in, in 2016, um, I found myself feeling fairly despondent about the state of our union. You know, I was very nervous about what was happening in the United States. And uh, I spent a lot of time feeling fairly down about uh, you know, where things were going. The country is very polarized politically. The country is very segregated ethnically and racially. It felt like this kind of experiment in a, a kind of democratic uh, society was really falling apart. And you could find evidence for that in almost every realm of American life. Um, and I was living in New York City, and I noticed that when I walked into a neighborhood library, a branch library, we call them, uh, I started to feel very differently than I did in most other places. I, I noticed in libraries that something very special was happening, and it made me pause to think about the role that they play in cities more generally. Because when I start talking about social infrastructure, um, you might think right away that, well, the problem with social infrastructure is it doesn't necessarily uh, bridge people from Englewood and Auburn Gresham, right? Like, look, go back to my heat wave example. People in Englewood really suffered because there, there was a, a, a paucity of social infrastructure within the, the neighborhood. They, they did not have terrific parks. They, there was no branch library, no set of um, uh, commercial spaces even where people could congregate. Conditions for life on the streets in a neighborhood like Englewood are fairly hostile. Some people might feel comfortable spending time outside. You know, young men, for instance, might feel emboldened to kind of <laughs> use the streets as they will, but older people, younger people, people who are frail, uh, women at night might not feel as safe and secure and as comfortable in, in, a, in a place like like Englewood. And so you get this kind of emaciated social life. But that's just internal to the world of Englewood. I talked about all of you fortunate people on this side of the room who live in Auburn Gresham and you benefit from the terrific amenities that you have in the neighborhood, you know, by virtue of the density and the investment that people have made in the place over time, despite your poverty, you kind of maintain these public spaces, these gathering places that work very well. And there's a rich social life, not to discount all the things that you have to deal with, being a segregated neighborhood, being poor, but the social infrastructure allows for a certain kind of social connection. 
the fact that you're flir relatively flourishing here and you're doing so badly here in Englewood still doesn't speak to this larger problem, which is that people in Englewood are not much welcome in Auburn Gresham. People in Auburn Gresham have very little to, reason to go into Englewood. And so we have a kind of segregated and separated society here. At a moment like this, it's, it's useful to ask, you know, are there, are there places that we could build, are there investments in social infrastructure that we could make? Are there gathering places that work as bridging devices and not just as bonding devices? Right? The, the conditions in, in, in Auburn Gresham allow for a kind of bonding. Imagine now we have Auburn Gresham, but it's a very wealthy place. Let's go to the north side of Chicago. It's possible that the kind of institutions, the physical places that help you bond, exacerbate inequality, right? make the problems worse because it makes it easier for you to hoard resources. You know, the country club, the golf club. The amazing kind of social infrastructure, right? If you think what, what a country club is designed to give you a beautiful, luxurious place where you can congregate, where you can have serendipitous encounters with people, right? Where you can have intimate occasions, you can do special parties, you can have a regular dinner, you can do cocktails, you can relax at the swimming pool, you can get to know each other on the golf course. Country club is designed to be an extraordinary kind of social infrastructure. It's just that you're not invited in, right? And even over here in our wealthier neighborhood, it's like just the people on this side of the room can get into that country club and you can't. And so now we have an amazing piece of social infrastructure but the country club is being used to hoard opportunities, right? We, we're building a social network that we're using to make sure that our kids get the best jobs, right? That our families get into the best schools. And so we start to get very upset about the things that they have over here in these other areas and the thing starts to fall apart. So living through this moment where uh, kind of my democratic society seems to be falling apart. It seemed important to me to try to seize upon the places where something different was happening. And what I noticed when I started to spend time in these local libraries, these neighborhood libraries around New York City, and I spent the kind of the better part of a year going to different places, is that they, they were remarkable. They stood out, they felt different from so many of the other institutions that I have where I've spent time and I tried to make sense of like you know what what was it that was happening that made them distinctive um, the title for my book palaces for the people comes from uh, Andrew Carnegie who's you know was a Scottish originally moved to the United States an immigrant to the United States um, he um, you know was a great industrialist um, massively wealthy, right? The Elon Musk of his time. Um, not always the greatest human being, by the way, to be clear. Just, you know, we oftentimes kind of speak of these great uh, wealthy people as if they walk on water. Uh, union buster hired um, uh, kind of nasty uh, private security to uh, violently attack striking workers. Um, anti-labor against the income tax, uh, you know, not do, did not get all A's, uh, but um, was the greatest philanthropist in the history of the library as an institution. Um, as an immigrant, as a child, he um, spent time in libraries and found that they were these kind of special places that gave him an opportunity to learn and to develop himself, and he. This, you know, he realized that uh, working people in the United States didn't really have a physical place where they could go and spend time and get that same experience of being exalted. And so there's a, a, a for, Carnegie wound up giving the equivalent of about two and a half billion dollars in today's money to libraries he built, helped to build more than 2,500 libraries around the world. And um, the deal that he made with governments um, was that he would pay for the physical construction of a library and then they would have to take over the cost of operating them. So it was kind of this 
public private partnership that became so uh, popular in American life. And there, there are actually a lot of different kinds of architectural styles in Carnegie libraries. Um, but there is a, a kind of classic form, which is very interesting. And um, the, the way you the, the way you kind of get in is you walk up a few steps, which you know, symbolically separates the library from the profane streets, right? It lifts you into some other place. The, typically, the, the kind of oh, the first floor of a Carnegie library has very high ceilings and big windows. A lot of light comes in. And so if you were working in a tenement, sorry, working in a factory or living in a tenement, um, your conditions were crowded and dark and dirty. You felt physically like you're in a different kind of place when you walked into a Carnegie library. Um, it was important that there be this kind of spirit of generosity towards people in them that got expressed architecturally, but conveyed interpersonally as well. And this is kind of an amazing thing. Um, you, you, you still find it when you walk into libraries in the United States, and I don't know if you have the same spirit here as well, uh, a notion that it's the, the mission of the library to offer some modicum of dignity and respect to people who walk in. And I don't know if that's part of the ethos of the, of, of the library here as well, but it really is a remarkable thing. There's, um, there's a neighborhood not too far from New York University uh, called the Lower East Side. Do, do you know New York City at all? Does, if I say Lower East Side, does that mean anything? Lower East Side is kind of a famous immigrant neighborhood. Um, had a lot of uh, a lot of Irish immigrants. Uh, as they kind of made it in America, they got replaced by Jewish immigrants. As they kind of made it in America, they got replaced by uh, Asians. And it, it remains like kind of like a Jewish Chinatown with a lot of blacks and Latinos now. It's a kind of interesting part of New York City, very vibrant, um, very crowded, very dense. Uh, also, like a lot of neighborhoods in superstar cities these days, getting more and more gentrified. You talk about gentrification here, is that is that a thing in Belfast? Is that gentrified? I know it's a thing in Belfast. So a lot of gentrification. So the Lower East Side of New York City, like if it, it's like if you wake up in the morning, if you're the kind of person who wakes up in the morning and you think to yourself, like, where could I find a $15 ice cream cone, you know, in a place where the only flavor is lavender, you would go to the Lower East Side. You know, that's the, that, that's the kind of neighborhood where you would go. It's, it's full of $15 ice cream cones, lavender flavor only. And I don't know if this happens here in Belfast, there's the, the fancy coffee shops, they don't take cash on the Lower East Side increasingly. You can only pay if you have a credit card. Do you have places like this here? Sorry, we, we don't take cash here. So you, obviously some people can do that and others can't, right? And if you walk around the Lower East Side today, the question of who belongs is always on your mind, right? Because here we are in this kind of historically famous melting pot immigrant neighborhood, the first stop when you get to New York City. And there's still people like that, but to walk around the area is to see a kind of array of physical places, a kind of social infrastructure that is open to some and not to others. And you feel that very intensely when you're there. And I, 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 I know that everyone in this room is thinking about the neighborhoods you know, here or in Dublin, where, where you also feel that kind of thing happening, right? And I was spending all this time on the Lower East Side and, and watching this. And the way I got into this project is that um, it's like early one morning, I think about 9.30 in the morning, and there was a crowd of people outside of a branch library. And it turned out the library opened up at 10 o'clock in the morning. And it was a crowd of people that was very different than the crowds of people I saw in the coffee shop that doesn't accept cash or the $15 ice cream cone place. There were people waiting to get into the library who have credit cards and buy expensive coffee and fancy ice cream, but there were also people who did not. There were young people in their 20s, there were people in their 70s and 80s, there were parents with young children, 
people speaking different languages, waiting to go into the same place where they would ultimately spend hours. And when the doors opened and people walked up the steps to get into the library, the man who opened the door said, good morning. And his colleague said to people around, how, how can I help you? And they, you know, they didn't say, would you like fries with that? They didn't say, can I super, can you supersize your order? Uh, they, they weren't trying to sell something. They, the, the programming of the, the, the physical space itself was designed to be uplifting and accessible. And the ethos of the place as conveyed through the programming was designed to let people know that they were welcome there, regardless of who they were. And, and something remarkable happens, you know, when you spend time in the library. So, so people walk into the library, and now I'm reporting to you ethnographically, having spent a year or so in different places. People walk into the library, and it's not like the people of Auburn Gresham and the people of Englewood, they see each other, they recognize their shared humanity, they hug, they have lunch together. That's not what happens in the New York City Public Library, okay? This is not Woodstock, right? We're not in Shangri-La. People look at each other and they find their space. And maybe there's a nod. Sometimes we get a little annoyed at the person who spends too much time in the bathroom. In the United States, by the way, if you wake up in the morning and you're in a homeless shelter and you need some place to go for the day, they'll tell you to go to the library. Or if you have a substance abuse problem, they'll tell you to go to the library. You know, if you can't afford heat, you'll go to the library to, to get warm. Or if you're a school child and you're in a school that doesn't have a library anymore because they cut the budget and you have a research project to do, you might even go to the library with your classroom. If you're a teenager and school ends and you have nowhere to go, you'll go to the library. If you're an older person and you're looking for companionship or a book or a film, you'll go to the library. If you don't have home internet access, which millions of Americans don't have, you go to the library. So the library is drawing people from a lot of different places. And it's overwhelmed, ex exceedingly pop popular. Can't keep up with the demand. The physical plants, generally speaking, they need investment. There are not enough librarians. But to be in the library is to learn how to recognize the reality of other people, take them more seriously, and occasionally, deal with collective problems together because things do come up. It becomes clear that there's not enough space for the young people and a community conversation needs to happen. Or there's a contentious development plan in the neighborhood and they need a gathering place where people can come together and have a conversation about what might happen and the library is the ideal public place to do it. Or there's an election that's about to happen and you need to have a conversation about what the issues are. And the library serves that kind of function. Um, it does more exalted things too. Did, did this book that um, was very popular in the US 20 years ago called Bowling Alone, did it make it to Ireland? Does, does that reference mean anything to you? Bowling Alone? There's a political scientist named Robert Putnam uh, who wrote a book called Bowling Alone. And the, the metaphor of Bowling Alone was this idea that Americans used to bowl together in leagues and bowling was a very social occasion and he wrote this book documenting a decline in collective activities generally across the united states and the great kind of symbol of that is that he reported that more americans were bowling without bowling leagues they're just bowling alone and if you think about it that is one of the saddest images you could come up with right but i think bowling on its own is, is kind of sad uh, but bowling alone is even, you know, even more isolating. And it was, it was this kind of very powerful metaphor for things, things falling apart. And 
one of my kind of favorite the favorite things that I experienced going to libraries is that um, libraries are often doing this very creative programming, trying to figure out ways for people to spend time together that will be compelling. And, um, you know, in the U.S., as in Ireland and as in basically every nation uh, in the advanced industrial world right now, there are more people aging than ever before, um, more older people than ever before, more people aging alone than ever before. So this issue of social isolation has become a real problem. And, uh, you know, libraries um, have jumped into the fray and tried to deal with that problem. And so the library system in Brooklyn developed this thing they call the Library Lanes Program. They, they tend to have these common rooms that they can adapt for different purposes. And they basically created a bowling league for their older patrons that was a virtual league. So they would hook a television up to an Xbox and kind of video game console, and once a week, all of these older people, who are the people who, if you think about it, were the most at risk of dying and dying alone in the heat wave in Chicago, and the people who are older, living on their own, would come to the library and they would get bowling shirts and they would sit in these chairs that were assembled on the side and then the librarian would call the librarian from another library in the city and they would share the screen and they would literally do these virtual bowling competitions you know, people, you know, you don't have to hold the bowling ball because it's a virtual thing. You can be together with your team. It helps to create this kind of bonding. And the, the, one of my favorite sociological concepts comes from the um, French sociologist Emile Durkheim. It's called collective effervescence. And I don't, I don't know if you know this term. It's a great, it's a great concept. Durkheim was a sociologist of um, modern life, and he was interested in religion. He wrote a book called The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. That's kind of one of the great classics of sociology. And he talks about collective effervescence. It's a great concept. It's that, that kind of feeling of, of kind of social life and joy and camaraderie that bubbles up and just kind of washes over us when we come together in physical spaces and participate in something that feels special, something sacred. If, if those of you who go to church maybe recognize that occasionally you have those kind of moments where you just feel something welling up inside of you, those of you who get your religion watching football or going to a dance club or a theater will recognize these more secular versions of it, right? It's that, that feel like we, it's a thing that we really have missed during the pandemic, right? In the, in the lockdowns when we're home all the time, we did not get a lot of collective effervescence. Those of you watching on Zoom, we're so happy in this room here. You're all missing out on this feeling of collective <laughs> effervescence that we're having here, right? So there's, there's different ways of doing it. And I have to tell you, like, being in the Brooklyn libraries, watching older people come together to participate in the Library Lanes Bowling League on an Xbox, it, it was like watching Manchester United defeat Manchester City, you know, in the qualif qualif trying to qualify for the Champions League. I mean, it was a rocking, rollicking, high-fiving, laughing, hugging kind of event. It was a, an amazing experience. And, and being there, I, you know, I couldn't help but realize that, first of all, the, the people who were in the room connecting in this way, having this kind of physical experience, first, as I just said, were exactly the kinds of people demographically who are most likely to die and to die alone in a heat wave. Second, as I got to know them, I realized they weren't all people who lived in Auburn Gresham. That one of the things that our libraries or shared public social infrastructures can do is they can actually bring people from Englewood and Auburn Gresham into the same space to have those kinds of experiences. You have to design them well. You have to cite them appropriately. You have to think about where you're going to put them. You have to build them well. You have to maintain them. And if you program them, you do infinitely better. You know, if you program them with people who can make them special, you do infinitely better. That's the idea of social infrastructure. I, 
I'm not as quite as naive as I look, I know. Uh, I, I, I'm not here to tell you if you just build more libraries and playgrounds in Belfast, all of the troubles will go away. It's not that simple, obviously. The argument I want to make, it's, it's not if we just invested in social infrastructure, we would solve everything. It's not if only you had a library, if only you had more football pitches, if only you had more swimming pools. If, it's not exactly it. It's, it's more like if you're trying to rebuild a divided city or society, if you're trying to do something to cultivate this kind of ethos of inclusiveness, if you care about making it easier for people to bond with each other and also making it more likely that people in different places will establish bridges between their worlds as well. If, if those are your goals, you need to decide where you're going to lift the first shovel. You, you, need to, you need to decide where to begin. So the pitch I'm making, the kind of argument, it's, it's not, it's simple, this solves everything. It's that if what you really want to do is promote some, some world that feels more democratic, make a city that feels more inclusive, create places that give more people a chance to feel like they belong there. I think building social infrastructure is probably the best place to begin. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. With thanks to Professor Eric Kleinenberg of New York University and to Dr. Neil Galway of Queen's University Belfast, for more on planning from the School of Natural and Built Environment, visit go.qub.ac.uk slash nbe hyphen planning. For downloadable audio programs in this series, subscribe to Queen's University Belfast's Shaping a Better World podcast and follow us at QUB Engagement. <laughs>